on what? Oh, yes. Just as a reminder, because of VBS, there won't be a pool day at the Snyder's house Tuesday night. Aww. But there's VBS. Yay! Yay. Okay, good. We got it. <laughs> Very good. <laughs> well, today we're going to be talking about Holy Spirit as a guide, the Holy Spirit as our guide. And uh, if you were here last week, we talked a lot about kind of do's and don'ts, whatnot. And, you know, we can live one of two ways in this life. We can live by the law or we can live by grace. Amen. Amen. Father, we thank you for this morning. We thank you, Lord, for your word. God, it's precious to us. And Holy Spirit, I ask that you would guide my lips and what to say today, actions and attitudes and May your word come forth, a life-giving word. And I ask that each and every heart in here would be prepared to receive from you. Be our guide. We implore you to, to guide us. And, and Lord, we don't want to try and live by the law, but rather by your spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, I was originally going to start with my notes, but the Holy Spirit said, no, start with Genesis chapter 24, which is interesting because that was a passage of scripture I was going to leave out of the message because it was getting too long and it was going to be at the end. So how many know that when the Lord wants to do something, we're going to let him do something? Amen. Well, in Genesis chapter 24, we find an interesting account of Abraham, Isaac, and a servant. And this is after Sarah had passed away and Isaac was mourning and whatnot, and so was Abraham, obviously. But Abraham told his servant, the unnamed servant, go find a wife for my son. Now, that may seem kind of odd for us because, you know, in America, we don't normally think in that terms. I wouldn't tell uh, somebody who's working for me, I need you to go find a wife for Dean. That'd be, be kind of awkward for starters. But Abraham told that to his servant because that was the way things worked in that day. And the servant did something interesting. He relied upon the Lord. He asked the Lord to guide him. What's, what's neat about this passage as well in Genesis chapter 24 is that there's four people mentioned. You've got Abraham. And, and not only is this, listen, this is history. This is what really happened. The Bible is a history book, but it's also an awesome teaching tool as well. So not only do we have history in this, but we also have a parable summed up together because God is that awesome. He is multifaceted. His word is three-dimensional. It goes further than what we just read on the page, but there's so much depth and, and richness to it. But in here we have Abraham, who is a representation of the father. We have Isaac, who is a representation of the son. Yeah, you guys got this so far. And then there's the unnamed servant, who is a representation of the Holy Spirit. You're onto it so far right now, right? And then there's Rebecca, who happens to become the, the bride. So we have this. And what's interesting in all this is the servant goes, and as he goes to the foreign land to go find a bride for his, for his uh, master's son, he gets to a well, and he says, Lord, I don't, I don't know who to pick here, but would you send me the right one? And I want the right one to ask me to give me a drink and also a drink for my camels. Now, if you've read the passage, you know that the dude brought 10 camels. Camels can be really thirsty. And I found out that they can drink up to 40 gallons of water. 40 gallons. Now, water weighs 8 pounds per gallon. And if you do the math, you'll find out that that's 320 pounds. Did I do my math right? 8 times 4 is still 32, right? 320 pounds. Hey, the day and age we live, I just never know. <laughs> now, you got to do that common core math, man. you got to take 2, divide it by 6, and then multiply it by the fraction of pi. No, but you still weigh 320 pounds of... of just to, to water one camel, and there was 10 of them. So that means she could have pulled up to 3,200 pounds of water. Ladies, that would be work. That would make a man sweat right there. But she came down to the well, and she said, can I pull, give you something to drink, and can I give your camels to drink as well? And the dude was like, ding, 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 ding right? Didn't take a rocket scientist. He knew exactly who the Lord had just sent. And then he takes out the, the nose ring and the bracelet and he, he puts them on her. 
this was a sign that she was receiving the, the title as bride. Had she not received, then she would not have been the bride. But she received that as the bride. But the story doesn't end there. It continues on. It's not really a story. It's a historical account. I almost hate to use the word story. Because when you use the word story, what do you think of? Made Made up, right? This is a historical account. So the historical account goes on like this. that, That he went back to the house and met all the family and Laban was there. And you read about Laban a few chapters later with Jacob and whatnot. But that, Laban was Rebekah's brother. And Rebekah says yes, and they end up going back to meet the son. Isaac is a type of Christ in this passage. Rebekah didn't have a map to get back to Isaac. She could have probably gotten a map But what did she have? She had a guide. She had the servants, the guide, who knew the way to the son and how to get in the presence of the father as well. He knew the way back to home. Jesus said, the way that I'm going, you know. And and Thomas said, well, how do we know that way? And it's through him and, and through the Holy Spirit. We can live our lives in such a way that we don't have to worry about where we're going as long as we're being led by the Spirit. Because the Spirit is the one. He is the one. The Holy Spirit's the one who navigates us through this life. But we have to have ears to hear. We have to have hearts that are willing to obey. And that means sacrificing the things that we want to do in order to follow the way that the Spirit wants us to go. There's a song by Petra many years ago. It's called Minefield. And the lyrics are, life is a minefield. And that's the way life is. Satan does everything he can to try and kill us, steal from us, and destroy us. And not necessarily in that order. But the Holy Spirit is our guide. And he can walk us through that minefield. But we have to listen. We have to obey in that. And that's part of being a servant of the Lord. Because once we let him be Lord of our lives. That means we've given up our rights. We can hold on to our rights and follow the law and end up going to a place we don't want to go. Or we can surrender our rights and say, Holy Spirit, I'm going to let you guide me. Yesterday, we, uh, Jenny and I and her mom and Magnum, we went up to North Carolina. And we were going to visit family up there for a little get-together. Her niece had recently gotten married and she was in Japan and they Moved back, or they've come back to visit, so we're going to have a get-together and bless them with gifts and whatnot. I don't know the way to her niece's house, but she does. Now, I could have went to the store and bought a map of North Carolina and South Carolina and taped them together and highlighted the route and everything, or I could save myself a lot of hassle, time, and money and heartache and just say, Jenny, which way to go? Amen. And so that's what, what we did. We, we drove up to North Carolina. It was funny. Along the way, Jenny and her mom sat in the back, and I was the chauffeur. <laughs> and while they were in the back, they were knitting. They were, you know, oh, sorry. I'm sorry. Crocheting. Forgive me. There is a difference. They were crocheting. And while they were crocheting, I was maneuvering traffic, going in and out of traffic. I wasn't, you know, speeding. <laughs> don't even start. She said, what traffic? We're into our trip about, what, two hours, two and a half hours? And traffic comes to a standstill. It's I-26 up near Greenville area or Spartanburg area. And you, those of you that have driven it, you're like, yes, amen. It needs to be about four or five lanes wide on each side in that area as far as I'm concerned. Because it always seems like there's an accident in that area. And there was this time, and so I, as we came to a stop, I thought, I'm just curious how long this is going to take and how far we're going to go. So I reset. They've, she's got one of those trip odometers in her vehicle, it's a little Jeep thing. And we started, and, and as we're traveling along at 0.5 miles an hour, we get down there, and we're like 20 minutes in. I said, we've gone, you know, half a mile. <laughs> 30 minutes, we've gone one, one, or th- 1.6 miles. We finally get to where it was at, and a trucker had gone off the road and 
the rear of his trailer was sticking up in the air, crossing both lanes. He was down in the ditch, and we were actually formed down into one lane driving around the grass median. They en ended up shutting down 26 and rerouting traffic around that to get it out of the, the hole. But we managed, we were close enough. What was interesting is on the other side of the road, there was no accident, but traffic was backed up for about four or five miles because people were rubbernecking. Yeah. Y'all, don't look at me that way. Y'all have done the same thing. <laughs> but once we got past Spartanburg and got into the Greenville area or the Spartanburg area, up in the North Carolina at Hendersonville we stopped and ate lunch and then Jenny traded places with Magnum she sat up front with me and she led the way in go straight go around the roundabout they had one of those things you take a right and go up this hill and take a left and you're going to look for this road and take a left here right here and, and then there's their driveway she directed me all the way in to where we needed to go. And I use that as an illustration because the Holy Spirit is our guide. We can try and follow a map, and we'll get to that at the end of the service. Or we can listen to the leading of the Holy Spirit. And I don't know about you, but I want to be led by the Holy Spirit. He will guide us in all truth. He will tell us what is right and wrong. He will show us which way to go. So I hope this morning... That if you haven't been led by the Spirit, that today you would choose to make the Holy Spirit your best friend. That you allow Him to direct your steps to go in the direction you need to go. Allow Him to navigate your life around the minefield to get over those places and around those areas so that you don't get blasted by the enemy, but rather you're walking through enemy territory victoriously. Amen? Well, if you have your Bibles, turn with me to John chapter 16. In John chapter 16, verses 12 through 15, this is our passage for this morning. Jesus is talking here, and he's talking to his disciples. And he says, I still have many things to say to you, but you cannot bear them now. However, when he, the Spirit of truth, who is the Spirit of truth? The Holy Spirit. When he has come, there's a lot of wills in this passage. He will guide you into all truth. For he will not speak of his own authority, but whatever he hears, he will speak and he will tell you things to come. Is there any maze and there are maybes in there? Not a single one. Let's continue on. He will glorify me, for he will take of what is mine and declare it to you. All things that the Father has, has are mine. Therefore, I said that he will take of mine and declare it to you. So we have Jesus telling his disciples, the Holy Spirit's coming. And he will direct you in every good thing. He will direct your steps. He will you know, give praise to the Father and, and, and glorify me. He will take of what is mine and declare it to you. But that means we have to have ears to hear and hearts to respond, does it not? So that's what that means. And, and, but he's saying he's given a promise because of yet Jesus was still alive on the earth and he hadn't yet died and gone to the Father. But once he did that, we know it is the day of Pentecost. The Holy Spirit came. Listen, the day of Pentecost is continuing on. Jesus Christ, the same yesterday, today, and forever. The Holy Spirit is the same yesterday, today, and forever. That means the Father is the same yesterday, today, and forever. They are the same all, all the time. And so, therefore, the Holy Spirit has been sent to direct us. The baptism of the Holy Spirit is for every believer. It's not just for those that are a select few, but rather He is for everybody. He's there to lead us. But there's a promise and a pattern we want to get into. The Holy Spirit is God. John 16, 13, Jesus said, However, when He, the Spirit of truth, has come, He will guide you into all truth, for He will not speak on His own authority, but whatever He hears, He will speak, and He will tell you things to come. Now, if you're like me, I don't like hidden fees when it comes to purchasing stuff. I hate hidden fees. Hidden fees are not fun. And I prefer to know ahead of time what the cost of something is before I choose to buy it. This is one of the reasons why I don't like car shopping. And I'm sure I'm not the only one. Now, I know there's some people out there that love car shopping. You love the challenge. You love just talking those people down. You love saying no that's your favorite word to sell those people, and you get the absolute best deal. I'm not one of those people. I hate car shopping because I know that the sticker price is never the price you pay for the car. 
Most of the time, there are fees and special options that are tacked onto the price of the vehicle. <clears throat> and then there's the line, well, isn't this worth the extra 34 Isn't your wife worth the extra $34 a month? I have heard that line before, and not once. They are trained to say those things. So when you go in to buy a new car and you hear that, or isn't your spouse worth the extra $30 a month for such and such feature? They are, pro they are programmed to say those things. I know I used to be in sales. <laughs> well, when we allow the Holy Spirit to guide us, He will tell us of things to come. That's a promise. Jesus Himself told us that. It's His pattern. And God is not a man that He should lie. We can trust that when we trust in the Holy Spirit, He will guide us. How many in here would like to be a complete Christian? You just love to be a complete Christian. And you don't have to raise your hands, but I would imagine a majority of us in here would love to be a complete Christian. Romans 8, 14 says, For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, these are the sons of God. And this is a continual leading and following. And the word son here speaks of maturity, not as a little baby. Okay, So we're not talking about little babies, but maturity. And in order for us to be sons, the first thing is we, we need to be born again, right? We have to be born again as sons of God or daughters of God, however you want to put it. As many as are continually led by the God, these by God, these are the sons of God. And to be led means that you're willing, you have to be willing to yield. For example, when we were in the car, if Jenny said, take a right, and I went straight, am I yielding to her? No, I'm not. How many of you here have ever been asked by the driver, do I get off this exit? And you tell them, yes, and then they keep driving. <laughs> okay? It happens. There's a lack of trust. In, in, and when the Holy Spirit tells us something, we, and he say, when we ask him especially, should I get off here? And he says, yes, but if we keep driving, we're not yielding to the Holy Spirit, are we? And that's just the way we are. But we, we don't need to be that way. When it comes to the Holy Spirit, we need to listen and obey. Becoming a mature and complete Christian will require us to trust and yield to the Holy Spirit. And it means to be regularly led by the Holy Spirit. And, but there's a sad truth in this. There's so many Christians throughout the world that are missing this. They're staying in their pampers as babies and not being led by the Holy Spirit. Not coming into maturity and uh, into the mature, full Christian life that God intends for them. So the consequence of not listening to the Holy Spirit is not growing up in the Lord and becoming that mature person. Now there's, and we, we want to mature and walk into righteousness. Righteousness is a goal of a believer. Walking in sanctification, moving from glory to glory. We don't want to walk backwards, but we want to walk forward in this. We want to walk forward in our walk with the Lord. I want to be to the point where if I'm walking down the street and the Lord says, go into this place, I'm going to go into that place. And he says, minister to that person. I want to minister to that person. That's where I want to be in my walk with the Lord. Why? Because it's imperative for them to hear about Jesus Christ. Their eternity is at stake. My eternity. As for if, if nobody would have ministered to me, then I would have been lost as well. So there's two alternative ways to achieve righteousness. And they're mutually exclusive. And those two ways, the first one is law, the law. But if you're going to try and obtain righteousness through the law, that means you have to do all of the law, all of the time, no exceptions. The Bible says that if we offend in any one point, we're guilty of breaking the whole law. So the first way is you, it's the, a set of rules, the law. Keep them all keep them all the time. So keep them all and keep them all the time. The other way is grace. So you've got law on one hand, and, and these are mutually exclusive. In other words, you can't have both. You can't do a little bit of grace and a little bit of law. It's either all law or all grace. Grace, and, and, and grace is only received by one way, and we find this in Ephesians 2.8. For by grace you have been saved through faith. That's right. And not of yourselves. It's a gift of God. The beauty of salvation is it is a gift. You can't earn it. It, I actually know of somebody. They're not in this room, so don't look around. They, they say, if you would have known what I have done, there's no way God could forgive me. Let me tell you something. Yes, he can. Yes, he can. If you want to come into maturity, 
You can only come into maturity and righteousness by one of two ways, and that's either the law or grace. Now let's talk about the whole law all the time, or all the law all the time. For, we're going to dig into this just to look at both of these. All the law all the time. We'll spend a lot of our time right here. Deuteronomy 27, 26 says this, Cursed is one who does not confirm all the words of this law by observing them. Now, in context, the Israelites are repeating this curse upon themselves. They have just come out of the wilderness, and they're getting ready to enter the promised land, and they're going through the law. Moses is giving them this, and they say, basically, in a nutshell, if we don't keep this, then we're cursed. And he's right. They are right. And it's the same way with us. This curse Israel pronounced upon themselves. And Paul continues this thought in the New Testament. In New Testament. In Galatians 3.10, he says, For as many as of the works of the law are under the curse, for it is written, Cursed is everyone who does not continue in all things which are written in the book of the law to do them. Now, again, the word all, look that up in the Greek, and it means all. That's what it means. So you have to keep every single jot and, and tittle and every sentence, every little thing of it in order to achieve, achieve righteousness. Now, the bad news is, Nobody can do that, as we've all broken the law in one way or another. <clears throat> but if you want to gain righteousness through the law, you must continue in the law, all of the law, all of the time. Otherwise, the law is no benefit to you from the point of view of righteousness. So if you're trying to obtain righteousness through the law, you in trouble. Because you've got to keep all of the law, how long? Forever. All the time. So say this with me, all the law? All the law, all the time, all the time. There you go. James 2, 10 and 11 it says, For whoever shall keep the whole law and yet stumble in one point, he is guilty of all. For he who said, Do not commit adultery, also said, Do not murder. Now, if you do not commit adultery, but you do murder, you have become a transgressor of the law. And God's standards are so high that Jesus said, Even if you hate your brother in your heart, you're committing murder against that person. So you're already breaking the law. One cannot single out the commandments. You, listen, you cannot single out the commandments you think are important and leave out the ones you think are not important. In other words, I'll keep these and I won't the others. You have to keep every commandment all of the time. Otherwise, again, the law will be of no use for gaining righteousness to, and holiness. And again, most people think, well... I can keep, or I will keep most of the law some of the time. The reason being is because the natural mind has only one way of thinking towards righteousness, and that is by keeping a law. And most people think that they are, they're good people and are going to heaven as well. But the truth is, we're all like each other. We've all broken the, broken the law. And when we think of righteousness, we turn to laws and rules. That's just the way we work. The bad news is no one succeeds. No one is justified by the law. Romans 3.20 says, Therefore, by the deeds of the law, no flesh will be justified in his sight, for by the law is the knowledge of sin. It's like this. No one will ever receive righteousness by the law. The law shows us that we are sinners. It wasn't given to make anybody righteousness. It was given to show us that we need to be saved. It shows us that we cannot save ourselves. It also predicts a Savior who would be able to fulfill the whole law to redeem us from the law. Galatians 2.16 says this, Knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law. Do you know this this morning? Do you know that it's, you're not justified by the works of the law? Galatians 2.16 also, knowing that man is not justified by the works of the law, but by faith in Jesus Christ, even we have believed in Christ Jesus, that we might be justified by faith in Christ and not by the works of the law, for by the works of the law no flesh shall be justified. No one will ever achieve righteousness by keeping the law. We have believed in Christ that we might be made righteous through by faith, not by keeping the works of the law. The just shall live by faith. faith. That's correct. Galatians 3.11 says, But that no one is justified by the law in the sight of God is evident, for the just shall live by faith. Galatians 3.12, Yet the law is not of faith, but the man who does them shall live by them. So you've got two options. You've got 
grace and faith, or the law. Those are your two options this morning. If you can keep all the law all the time, you can obtain righteousness in the sight of God. But the alternative is by faith, which is by not observing the law. In other words, you can only do one, not both. Not parts of both. They are mutually exclusive. Are you with me so far this morning? The Christian faith is absolutely unique. Every other religion is works-based. You must do this and this and this to obtain righteousness. But Christianity is based on faith in Christ alone in order to receive righteousness. It is a gift. It's a gift. So the two alternative unions. Romans 7, 1 through 6 says this. Or do you not know, brethren, for I speak to those who know the law, that the law has dominion over a man as long as he lives? For the woman who has a husband is bound by the law to her husband as long as he lives. But if the husband dies, she is released from the law of her husband. So then if, while her husband lives, she marries another man, she will be called an adulteress. But if her husband dies, she is free from that law so that she is no adulteress, though she has married another man. Therefore, my brethren, you also have become dead to the law through the body of Christ, that you may be married to another, to him who was raised from the dead, that we should bear fruit to God. For when we were in the flesh, the sinful passions which were aroused by the law were at work in our members to bear fruit to death. But now we have been delivered from the law, having died to what we're, here, held, we're held by, so that we should serve in the newness of the spirit and not in the oldness of the letter. We have escaped the dominion of law through the death of Jesus. See, when you come under the law, it's a marriage contract where you're married to your fleshly nature. The law works on your fleshly nature and says, do this, don't do that. Once you're under the law, you're married to the fleshly nature, which is your flesh is a rebel by nature, is it not? Look at it, it goes all the way back to Adam. No matter how hard you try to keep the law, you won't succeed because the rebel in you won't do the right thing. And it, how many here are like me and you have had this experience? I think we all have had this experience if we're honest. You tried to keep the rules, but you didn't succeed. Been there, done that, got the t shirt. Burned it, by the way. So long as the fleshly nature is alive, we are still under the law. Now, the good news is that when Jesus was crucified, our fleshly nature was put to death in Him. And we are free to marry another, and that is Christ. To no longer be married to the flesh, because it is now dead, 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 as the evangelist used to say. That fleshly nature is dead through Christ, and now we're free to marry another, and that is Christ. We are now married by the Holy Spirit to the resurrected Christ. We are not married to the flesh anymore. We're not under the law when the law put us to death, it was the last thing it could do to us. And death has released us from the law to go into a union through the Spirit with Christ. Isn't that good news this morning? Romans 7, 5 says, So when we were in the flesh, God bless you, the sinful passions which were aroused by the law were at work in our members to bear fruit to death. What does this mean? This means that the law didn't stop us from sinning, but rather it stirred us up. Oh, I'm not allowed to do that? What does the flesh say? Mm hmm Right? That's the way it works. The law stirs us up. Now, does that mean the law is unrighteous? Absolutely not. The law is perfect and holy in every way. And it's a mirror that shows us, hey, you know what? We got a problem here. What I thought was good is actually pretty ugly. And that's ugly with a capital U. So the law did not stop us from sinning. It stirred us up. Romans 7, 6. But now we have been delivered from the law. Hallelujah. Having died to what we were held by. So that we should serve in the newness of the spirit. And not in the oldness of the letter. You know through marriage. That's how you bring forth offspring. Right? That's Through marriage you bring forth offspring. And when we were married to the flesh. We brought forth offspring of the flesh. Galatians 5, 19 through 21, Paul makes a list of that offspring. He starts to name some of them. 
Now the works of the flesh are evident, which are adultery, fornication. Fornication is sex outside of marriage, for those of you that don't know. Uncleanness, lewdness, idolatry. You may think, we don't have a problem with idolatry in America. Oh, yes, we do. There is a lot of idolatry that takes place in America. Sorcery. These are works of the flesh. Hatred. Contentions. Jealousies. Outbursts of wrath. And you could even put next to that road rage. <laughs> Selfish ambitions. Dissensions. Heresies. Envy. Murders. Drunkenness. Revelries. And of the like. Of which I tell you beforehand, just as I also told you in time past. Listen to this. That those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. There's a pretty good list here. You see, when we're led by the Spirit, we're not going to do these things. It's not a list of, oh, I, I don't, I, I'm, I'm not going to go commit idolatry today. I, I've got that on my list. But rather, when we're going through our day, if we're sensitive to the Holy Spirit, and He says, it's time to put the phone down. Oh, pastor, now you're meddling. It's time to shut the TV off. And we say, yes, Lord. And we put it down and walk away. Not a list of do's and don'ts, but rather being led by the Spirit. And he tells us, he'll, he'll warn us, of, he tells us of, of things to come. You ever go to walk out in your house and, and you, you have this feeling like, oh, I should, I should grab my wallet. Okay. And you get pulled over and you don't have your wallet and you're like, man, some, I knew I should have grabbed my wallet. It's the Holy Spirit telling you, you need to take your wallet because you're going to get pulled over. You may be going through a checkpoint. It could have just been a checkpoint that you're going through. You know, they set up the DUI checkpoints or whatnot. Anything like that. To being sensitive to his leading. It doesn't necessarily have to be a matter of sin or not sin, but rather it just living life. God wants to be a part. He wants to lead us. He wants to be a part. And what happens is, as we allow the Holy Spirit to lead us, there comes times of worship as well. Where you get an overwhelming sense of His presence, and just worship will flow. You see, if you're married to a bad man, you're going to bring forth bad children. <laughs> but now we are free from that union by the Holy Spirit, which means that we're free to bring forth righteousness of the fruit of the Spirit. The righteousness through Christ, which is the fruit of the Spirit. Now listen, as long as you try to be good, you can't. <laughs> That is the most frustrating thing you will face in your life. If you try to be good, it's not going to happen. But if you are led by the Spirit, that's a whole different ballgame. The message is this. Until you are united with the Holy Spirit and led by Him, you will fail at producing good fruit. Once you are united with Him, the Holy Spirit, then good fruit will come naturally. You won't be striving to try to produce good fruit. It will produce as you are led by the Spirit. Romans 7, 7 through 17 says this. What shall we say then? Is the law sin? Certainly not. On the contrary, I would have not known what sin is except through the law. For I would have not known covetousness unless the law had said, You shall not covet. But sin, taking opportunity by the commandment, produced in me all manner of evil desire. For apart from the law, sin was dead. I was alive once without the law. 
But when the commandment came, sin revived and I died. And the commandment, which was to bring life, I found to bring death. For sin, taking occasion by the commandment, deceived me, and by it killed me. Therefore, the law is holy, and the commandment holy, and just, and good. Has then what is good become death to me? Certainly not. But sin, that it might appear sin, was produced death in, producing death in me through what is good, so that sin through the commandment might be, become exceedingly sinful. For we know that the law is spiritual, but I am carnal, sold under sin. For what I am doing, I do not understand. For what I will to do, that I do not practice. But what I hate, that I do. He was in quite the conundrum, wasn't he? And if we're honest here this morning, we've all been in that boat. The things I want to do, I don't do. The things I don't want to do, I do. Oh, what a wretched person I am. If then I do what I will not do, I agree with the law that it is good. But now it is no longer I who do it, but sin who dwells in me. You see, the fault is not in the law, but in us. The law shuts us up to our own fleshly efforts. When we try to do things in our own strength, we find that we cannot do it. The harder we try, the less we succeed. The sin nature goes, again, all the way back to Adam. Adam didn't have any children until after he fell. So sin, the sin nature is passed down through the children, through the seed. Adam was the first rebel, and all his descendants are rebels as well. The primary purpose of the law, then, is to bring sin to light. For without the law, we think we're good people. But the law stirs up sin nature in us and brings us to light that we are not good at all and we are in need, need of a Savior. So we have to look deeply at one way to obtain righteousness. We've looked deeply at this. One way to obtain righteousness is through the law. And it's painfully obvious that we are not going to obtain righteousness through the law. We need grace. And by the way, grace cannot be earned. Grace is God's goodness that we don't deserve. You know, it's interesting that religious people have the hardest time receiving God's grace. Their thinking is, I have to do something to deserve this. This is why non-religious people receive, who receive salvation also seem to receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit and the gifts of the Holy Spirit a whole lot faster than religious people. Because our religious minds think, well, I've got to do something special to deserve the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Let me tell you something. No, you don't. You don't. That's good news right there. You need to receive Christ as Savior. Ask for the baptism of the Holy Spirit and open your mouth and start speaking in tongues. Hello? Want the gifts of the Spirit? Ask the Lord to grant you the gifts that He has for you and start operating in them. It's not hard. You just have to do it. Amen? Amen? It's awfully quiet in here. See, non-religious people realize that salvation is a gift and so is everything else. Every good and perfect gift comes down from the Father of lights in heaven. You may be thinking this morning, but what if I ask for the Holy Spirit and I get something different? You need to go back to the scriptures. Jesus addressed this very same issue. He said, which of you, being evil would give your son a scorpion if he asked for a piece of bread. Hey, nobody would do that. Not in their right. Even evil people wouldn't do that. You'd have to be completely twisted and demented to give your son a scorpion if he asked for a piece of bread. How much more will the Father in heaven give you the Holy Spirit to them that ask? He's not up there holding back the Holy Spirit saying, No, nah, no. Nah. You need to wait a little bit more, Holy Spirit. You've got to wait for Sally Sue because she hasn't cried enough. She hasn't, she hasn't said good enough words yet. She hasn't. No, that's not the way this works. Ask and you shall receive so that your joy will be made full. I'm getting off track here. Let's continue on. There are scores of religious people that haven't received the baptism of the Holy Spirit because they think they have to earn it. You will never be good enough to receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit. It's the grace. It is grace in that third part of God who comes to dwell in us. Say this with me, please. Grace cannot be earned. Grace, grace cannot be earned. Do you believe that this morning? Yes. It's either law or grace. You can't have it both ways. Grace operates by faith through the Holy Spirit. Romans 6, 14 says, For sin shall not have dominion over you, for you're not under the law, but under grace. If you are having a problem with sin, 
then it's time to get out from underneath the law and start living in grace. It's time to start letting the Holy Spirit guide you instead of your own flesh guide you. It's time to let the Holy Spirit lead you through the minefields instead of trying to rely on the flesh. Instead of thinking, I have to do this and I can't do that, but rather saying, Holy Spirit, lead me in this life. I've got a problem and I need you to get me through this minefield. Mm. The implication of Romans 6.14 is that if you're under the law, then sin will have dominion over you. So if you're struggling with sin, it might be a case that you're struggling with the law. You're trying to live by the law instead of living by God's spirit. I'm going to tell you something. This walk is going to go a whole lot easier Amen. if we'll yield to the Holy Spirit. Romans 8, 14 also says this. It says, For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, these are the sons of God. So how do we live as sons of God? <laughs> by the Holy Spirit. It's not by a set of rules, by do's and don'ts. Because He's the one that will tell you yes and no. It's the only way that we can live as God's mature, grown-up children is to be led by His Spirit. Galatians 5.18 says, But if you're led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. So how can you become a son of God? By being led by the Spirit. You've got to get born again, obviously. But then you need to be led by His Spirit. And if you're led by the Spirit, then you're no longer under the law. You can't have it both ways. You can't have law and grace. For most Christians, they use the law as a crushed, crutch. But God says, throw away the crutch. Be healed. Walk in grace. And it may tr frighten you to trust in God's grace. But I, I challenge you this morning to commit to that. 2 Corinthians 3, 1 through 3 says, Do we begin again to commend ourselves? Or do we need, as some others, epistles of commendation to you or letters of commendation from you? You are our epistle written in our hearts, known and read by all men. Clearly you are the epistle of Christ, ministered by us, written not with ink, <coughs> but by the Spirit of the living God, not on tablets of stone, but on tablets of flesh, that is, of the heart. You see, the law was written on tablets of stone. That's external. It didn't do any good because the problem was on the inside. Paul says, saying that by the Spirit... He can write God's law on our hearts. And what is on your heart will determine the way that you live. The law is from without, but grace is from within. God's way of righteousness and holiness is not struggling, but rather yielding to the Holy Spirit. Can you say this with me? Holy Spirit, take over. Holy Spirit, take over. Amen. Amen. <laughs> you say... Well, but I, I've, you, I know we've got willpower. The problem is when we start using willpower to try and keep the law, we need to divert our willpower to use our willpower to not doing things ourselves. To use our willpower to not do things ourselves. It's not effort, but union. Jesus said in John 15, 1, 4, and 5, said, I am the true vine, and my Father is the vine dresser. Abide in me, and I in you, as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you, unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me, and I in him, bears much fruit. For without me, you can do nothing. You see, when we're part of the vine, we're connected in. Oh, by the way, there's three people in this passage. You've got God the Father, who's the vine dresser. You've got God the Son, who is the vine. And then, and then you've got the people, the Holy Spirit. But the, Holy, uh, the people are the, the little branches. The Holy Spirit's the sap that runs through and empowers all those branches. Amen. And apart from Christ, we can do nothing because the Holy Spirit flows through Him and out through us. And that's how we yield fruit, because we are part of the vine. As we yield to Him, we don't struggle to produce fruit. We should not be struggling for, to produce uh, the, the fruit of the Spirit. It should not be a struggle to produce love towards people. If it is a struggle to produce love towards people, then we need to make sure that we're not disconnected from the branch, from the, from the vine, I'm sorry. 
If we, we're struggling to produce patience and, or to see patience produced in our lives, we need to check and make sure that we're being led by the Spirit. And if we're not being led by the Spirit, then we're trying to do it on our own accord. And that's a horrible way to live. It's a bummer, man. <laughs> Sorry. No, I'm not. We don't need to struggle. It's not struggling, but yielding. Not struggling, but yielding. It's not effort, but union. To produce the fruit of the Spirit is not struggling, but yielding to the Holy Spirit. It's not effort, but it's union. It's union instead. You see, the same life that's in the trunk of the vines flows through the branches. And that's how we can bear fruit. And bear, that's the fruit of the Spirit. Not through effort, but through union with the Holy Spirit. And I want to end with this last parable. Imagine with me a young man who has gone to college. He is quite a brilliant young man. He's genius level. And he's gone to a different country, a country not his own. He's not familiar with this country, completely foreign to him. So he is in a foreign country. And he's given two options. He could take a map or a local guide. And he says, well, I'm a pretty smart fella. I can read a map. I'll take the map. And he takes that map and begins on his journey. The day is sunny and bright. The weather is wonderful. And he starts out along the road with his map. By nightfall, when it gets dark, he has to, comes to a complete stop and realizes there's a problem. Because right in front of him, there is a cliff 300 feet deep. And he's scared. He no longer knows where he's at on the map. He has lost his way. And he cries out for help. And all of a sudden, someone appears there and says, can I help you? He says, yes, I'm lost. He said, well, just so happens I'm a local guide. I can help. But you need to put the map away. So he puts the map away, and he's now depending on the guide. The guide gets him out from there and gets him back on the road. They walk for a while, and the man, the boy thinks, you know what? I don't need you, guide, anymore. I've got my map. So the guide disappears when he pulls out his map. Now, obviously, by now, you understand that the guide is the Holy Spirit. And he starts reading the map again, and, and this time, he, a little while later, two days later, he finds himself in, in a bog. And as he's walking in this bog, not the bog of eternal stench for those of you that know what I'm talking about, but he's walking in this bog as it gets deeper and deeper. He realizes, I'm in trouble again. And he cries out for help. And all of a sudden, out of nowhere, as he puts the map away, the guide appears and says, can I help you? Why, yes, I'm lost and I need to get out of this bog. And he says, I can lead you out. And he leads him out of the bog. And they begin to walk down the road again. The sun comes out, and as they're walking along, the boy says, I have a map. Do you want it? And the guide says, no. I wrote the map. I know the way. How many of us, and you don't have to raise your hand, but how many of us have gotten the map out time after time again and found ourselves in another situation Crying out to the Lord, God, give me guidance. I don't know what I'm doing. As the praise team comes, I want to let you know that the Lord has freely offered His gift of the Holy Spirit to us. He wants us to be led by His Spirit. And if you've been trying to do it with both, with grace and law, you need to understand today that it's one or the other. And I would encourage you to be led by His Spirit. It's either by His Holy Spirit or by the law. Be led by His Holy Spirit. Would you please stand with me this morning? I want to open up the altars this morning. Maybe you've been trying to do it all yourself. Would you surrender to the leading of the Holy Spirit today? You may be struggling with something that keeps hammering you, and you're like, if only I could do better at this. You see, we need to take the eye out of the equation. And what it needs to be is, Holy Spirit, guide me through this life, through this minefield, through this journey. And He'll do it. Amen. If you don't know Christ as Savior, I would encourage you to make today the day of salvation. Don't wait until tomorrow. Tomorrow may never come. The Lord wants you to follow after Him.
and then to put your trust and faith into his Holy Spirit. You see, when Christ rose from the dead and went to heaven, he sent the Holy Spirit to us so that we could live not as defeated people, but as empowered overcomers, people that are led by him, but that requires us to yield ourselves to the leading of the Holy Spirit. While the praise team leads us in a song, if you need Christ as Savior, I'd love to speak with you. If you need healing in your body, I'll be more than happy to pray for you. But if you just want to come hang out with the Holy Spirit and invite Him and repent of doing it yourself and invite Him to lead you, would you please come this morning as well? Father of creation, unfold your song. Raise up blood souls and generations that will march through the land. All of creation is longing for your unveiling of power. Would you? Amen. Let's go before the Lord one more time. Lord, we submit and surrender to you. Holy Spirit, we ask that you would guide each and every one of us. Um, keep us away from trying to do things in our own effort. Forgive us for trying to do things in our own effort, trying to keep the law. And Lord, I know that means that we, we, don't, we don't just go out there and break your law, but rather we're being led by your Spirit who keep us from those things. I thank you and praise you for keeping us from sin. 
and for making it so that it's not through our effort, but rather it's through you. It's not through our own effort. It's not through our own uh, uh, blood, sweat, and tears, but rather you've already done those things for us. We just have to yield. I pray for any heart in this place that still hasn't yielded to the Holy Spirit. Lord, that you wouldn't leave them that way, but rather that their hearts would be pricked, that they would bleed for you, that their hearts would be warm to you and yield to the Holy Spirit. Empower us as we leave from this place, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you for coming this morning. Uh, VBS is tonight at 630. We'll see you then. And those of you that can help pick up chairs, stacks of 12, please.